What's going on, gym bros and gym girls? My name is James, and welcome to episode 11 of Gym Bro Talks. Today's special guest is Bill Maeda. He is the most shredded 53-year-old you've ever seen on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you're looking to spice up your training a little bit and make your training more functional, Bill's advice and the things he's going to be talking about in this episode is truly going to be a breath of fresh air. So without further ado, let's dive right into the episode, and I hope you guys enjoy this one. How are you doing today, Bill? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm James, I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Uh, life's good. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time out of your day to come on to this show. I really appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you reaching out and arranging this. Yeah, awesome. So I kind of want to just really dive right into it because you are known for your functional training, your breathing. And I think that functional training is very overlooked in the fitness industry these days, right? So when you go into the gym, 90% of the guys are doing their up and down movements, their side to side movements. No one's ever doing your rotational movements, your anti-rotational movements. And the thing is, as we know, our body is not made to just move in one plane of motion. We have to kind of go around and, and really work everything and be really well-rounded. And so I know yes. previously when we had our chat on the phone, you said you do most of your training based off of jujitsu. Um, do you mind kind of telling, t- telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I I used, I guess in our conversation, jujitsu was one of the reasons, um, right. you know, but to back up just a little before that, um, it actually started more with, well, a few things. Um, I started, I've always been a martial artist. I, To me, weights were a means of getting better at martial arts, and they still are. Mm. You know, people used to think when I was younger that I was a bodybuilder. Mm. Um, a lot of the way I look and a lot of the way I'm built looks kind of bodybuilder-ish, but um, that is that is largely just a genetic thing. Right. I mean, my brother, who's older than I am, he's slightly, he's built differently, but he also is quite, without really having to put much effort into his training, he just carries a lot of muscle. He's always He's always had a six pack and all kinds of things, so... A lot of that is genetic, but uh, a lot of my, um, before I even knew what functional training was, it came from wanting to do, I was kind of, (laughs) I was using weights to kind of hack or cheat at martial arts. And my first martial art was Kyokushin Karate and, um, or Karate. And, um, you know, I learned quickly that. You know, I was always, when I started taking that, I would always try, like most people, I, I was right-handed dominant. So I would always try and punch and kick with the right. And soon, literally, I'd get very tired on that side. Or um, it basically, I had instructors that, that made me aware that I was a one-sided right. fighter. And I was getting beat a lot because of that. It was very predictable. Everyone who would spar with me, I was a kid back then, but... They knew everything was coming from the right side, mm-hmm. so there wasn't a lot of, yeah, uh, it didn't take a lot for them to neutralize that. And then I was shocked when I was working out on a heavy bag. I remember I was 14, and I was really surprised because I could really, for my age, I could hit very hard with my right, both my kick and my punch. Right. But when I started, my parents bought me my own heavy bag, and I hung it out on a mango tree in the yard. I was really surprised and um, yeah, that how inept I felt, even though the arms appeared and the legs appeared the same, their function was totally different. Mm. And then I had an instructor that, that asked me, Hey, you know, I notice you like you favor your right side a lot, but in our, in fighting a lot, if you hit someone the wrong way, especially if you punch them the wrong way, it's very likely you're going to hurt your hand right. and it's going to be now impaired. And if that's the case, you better have a backup plan. And that backup plan is going to be your left side. I see what you mean. And that made a lot of sense to me. And even though I didn't really like the way I felt, I mean, the, it's like asking someone who can throw. Most guys can, or most people can throw quite well with, say, their right arm. 
And then you give them the same ball or a rock or whatever, and have to ask them to throw in the left, and it is a totally different story. So, um, but I was kind of, in a way, a little frustrated by that, but I was also fascinated by how that worked. And it became clear to me that I wanted to have two right hands and two ah, right there legs. You go. I see. What you mean. And so I started, and just how difficult it was. I, w- I would literally get more winded trying to throw my left side. It was That's how bad it was. But it started to come up. And then um, three years later, I'm sorry, two years later, I was playing football. Um, it was like uh, high school football. And, and I injured my shoulder that re- in a way that required me to get uh, some stainless steel pins put in my right shoulder. So now my right shoulder is actually injured just like my instructor said when i was younger and uh by that time i was very much into the kick call it well in the 80s it became kickboxing so um i just drilled with my left arm my left arm i started Mm. riding with my left arm and that kind of taught me to to get what i i call a constant but a mild but constant obsession with ambidexterity Mm because I really started getting good at doing things with my left. I started punching, I could write, I would, you know, I, my dexterity with my, to this day, I still like to amuse my daughters, <clears throat> like by taking two pens or pencils and writing no the way. same thing at the same time um, with both hands. And the left side is quite legible. So, and um, I didn't know the left brain, right brain thing. You know, this was like mid eighties and nobody I think knew that, Right. but, it just by the time the my the cast came off my arm and everything, and I returned to um, practicing again, I could I was into switching my stances. I didn't really know what I was doing, but whenever somebody would start to beat me up in class, I would switch my stance and start. And at least it, if I wouldn't, it would at least delay them kicking my butt. But um, yeah, I so from that. Um, I guess that's why even the, to this day, you'll see it's very rare now that I'm doing a, a bilateral movement. And if I'm doing a bilateral movement, usually in some way, my base is compromised or there's going to be something that's, yeah, because um, basically through the ambidexterity training and training one side and the other side, um, I also kind of got learned that I'm not going to wear out as quickly Yeah. as, you know, um, yeah, I think I had some instructor that told me, uh, and this was in massage school later on when in my thirties, when I was taking massage therapy courses, they said that your, your, anything that sticks out of your clothing, your legs, your arms and your neck, those are, and your head, those are portals through which gravity enters your body. Hmm. And, you know, just like you wouldn't want to drive only on one street yeah. in your neighborhood, you know, yet you want all your roads to kind of wear, not necessarily wear down evenly, but develop evenly. And I kind of took that to heart. And that's why I'm always changing. I Anything that I do that's unilateral on one side, I, I have to be able to replicate that as well or better on my less dominant left side. And that's very important to me. Yeah, I know. I never thought about it like that, where you want two right arms. And I think thinking about it in that perspective. Yeah, that concept has always always been, um, because in my teens, I kind of had a, a, what was, it was actually, I'm realizing now, it was a little, it was quite a serious neurosis. I became obsessed with the fact that in the the mid to late 80s, you know, the Soviet Union, which is, yeah, um, there was a significant threat in my mind that there was going to be a nuclear war. Mm. There was all the movies were about new. I think I watched too many movies and mm. read too many books about it, but I became kind of convinced that that was inevitable. And in high school, I stopped doing well in school. Number one, I became a little bit psycho about it. I, I became, I guess, in a way depressed. Right. And I became apathetic towards school because I was thinking, you know, what's the point of trying hard if we just everyone's just going to die? Mm. And I really believed it to that degree. And maybe I should have seen a therapist or something in hindsight. But I started training to be a 
soldier. I wanted to be a special forces soldier when I was God from, I think 14. Mm. And I, I wanted, I, I was very serious about, you know, um, surviving and, you know, uh, gaining the skills it would take to fight and survive. And, um, so that ambidexterity thing became even more important. You know, when I started running, I was even aware of how hard I'd land on one foot versus the other foot. I see all kinds of things. Yeah. And then a lot of my diet or what, I guess what I'll call my diet principles came from that time as well. And we can discuss that later if you'd like to, of course, but, um, yeah, a lot of, so, so yeah, that functional training came from me wanting to be a number one starting as a martial artist. And I found that being able to throw equally well with both sides was in a way a hack or a shortcut, especially, especially around more experienced or better fighters than myself. If I noticed they were very, they held their stance very strongly and I kept switching mine. I could at least uh, I could score on them in ways that I knew that weren't at the time expecting. Now with MMA and everything, people are much more onto that. Of course. But back in the '80s, people held you know it was very you, you you were very committed to one stance. I think and, even and like these days with boxing, it's like oh, boxing is yeah, it's still kind of yeah, one sided. But I, I think there's right. definitely a lot of advantages to being having like equal sides of, of power. I don't know if you've ever heard of Wing Chun. Yes, I, I studied at the Eno Santo Academy in, in Los Angeles. No way. And yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that was about 1994. Right. And um, that was literally when MMA was just breaking out. Um, a few, just a year before I moved from Honolulu, uh, Halson and Homolo Gracie had moved to Honolulu and started teaching the people in Hawaii, right. Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And I was lucky enough to tr study with them a little while. And then shortly after I started, I moved to Los Angeles and I joined the Eno Santo Academy and Wing Chun and Jeet Kune Do were, that was the primary thing there, but it's kind of funny, Muay Thai. And Eric Paulson, I remember, he's, uh, you know, one of the probably Hall of Famer uh, MMA guy. Uh, he was training for MMA there. So jiu-jitsu was just starting to enter that place. But it was a lot of Muay Thai. It was kind of a really interesting mix of Muay Thai, Savat, and uh, Jeet Kune Do mm. that they had going on there. And it was wicked. Yeah. Jeet Kune Do is, uh, Jeet Kune Do is very is almost a little bit more one-sided, right? Because I know um, I've heard one of my old masters, Wing Chun masters, he was talking about how, because when Bruce Lee started Jeet Kune Do, he started with the foundation of Wing Chun, but then his yeah, right foundation. leg was a little bit longer than his left leg, and that's why he would... Yeah, so they would put that on the front, yeah, yeah, the right side. Yeah, yeah. Um, but regardless of what style I was taught, um, I never, you know, I guess the advantage of, of, you know, holding of taking a stance and just, you know, is you become very good out of that stance, but I was never really that interested. I mean, I liked the martial arts, but I wasn't obsessed mm. with becoming a black belt to this day. I, I never represent myself as an instructor in martial arts. I'm very novice level. Most guys could kick my butt. Um, but I always liked to use both. I guess ambidexterity and then kind of the way I trained was um, a lot of what you see me doing is in a way a martial art, but it's not a martial art necessarily to help me win. A lot of those things that you see me do with sandbags are to help me not lose <laughs> a little longer <laughs> to stave off the inevitable. Mm -hmm. Or should I actually have to, you know, engage in a, a street altercation that um, I'm not out to, to kick anyone's ass, especially at my age, but I just don't, I, I want to be a little bit harder to kill than the next guy. Of course. Um, w with my level of training. So, yeah, that, that's that's kind of a thing. And but I'm sorry, going back. No, of course. Um, I just wanted to ask because when you're doing stuff like, 
you know, jujitsu and you're training really for to be able to be more like heavy and be be have a little bit more technique and in terms of like but you also want to because jujitsu is so much technique that you have to kind of almost flow with your opponent right because as bruce Lee said you want to be like water but then you also kind of want to have that foundation set in the body um that way you're just like crashing like a noodle but then you have this ability to submit someone um Mm -hmm. but with a a very fluid motion yeah i think that's that's what fascinated me about jujitsu so much and to this day it still does I when I haven't gone to class and gosh since since we locked down mm. even before that I'd hurt my neck before the pandemic but and I haven't returned um, because I've been busy now doing what I'm doing on social media but uh, it's not much of an excuse but I'm just constantly fascinated by the the great the leverage how yeah. not a brute sport it, how how it's not based on brute force I mean I. Tr- I tried brute force for a long time in that thing when I was younger. Um, And I knew that they would get me, but I always thought that now if I'm just, if I just get really gnarly on this guy, I can, I can break through that. And it just never worked out that way. And I'm just, yet that doesn't frustrate me at all. I, I'll go to jujitsu class and I'll lose all day long. I always feel honored by whoever is able to do that to me. And um, I learned so much from that. I really do. I, I feel like I learned more than just trying to, like simulating what the average street guy would try to do against a jujitsu guy. That's what my my uh, my buddies in class would tell me. They said, we like rolling with you because you're kind of, I mean, I'm not just totally like crazy, but, I go after it the way somebody who's not, yeah, who's not like jujitsu trained. And they kind of like that, that it's a little more raw. And it's a little little bit more um, real, like a real world situation where most likely this guy doesn't know jujitsu, but he might have a lot of force. Yeah, just a lot of strength. And and, um, yeah, and I I do, I I try to, it's, I, I don't mean to disrespect anybody who takes it, you know, but I actually try to try to use rolling with people like to develop my grip, mm. like, you know, hooking the back of the 100%. neck and just I, to develop my hands. And yeah, it's, I, I know I shouldn't use my, my partners as, <laughs> as uh, resistance <laughs> apparatus, but um, at the same time, I, I am trying to, trying to, 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 to bring it to them as well. So, and, but it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. It's and like, an art. and it's kind of crazy how, you know, when you're rolling with someone, they don't have to be bigger t- than you to win. They they can be a lot smaller. Oh, the worst than guys you. are the smaller yeah, ones. It's crazy. Yeah. And even like yeah, it's like the yeah. same idea as Wing Chun where you know apparently Wing Chun is is developed and made by a woman. So it's almost as if the woman uses these techniques in order to fight like a bigger guy and to defend themselves from a bigger mm-hmm. guy and you have to use techniques where you're not using force but you're using structure and you're using speed and you're using shortcuts and uh to, to right. kind of get around the person right yeah yeah no that's awesome I, I love you know i think martial arts is is amazing and i think martial arts you know like you said translates a lot into you know functional training and things like that but i wanted to ask because i know a lot of people ask about your breathing techniques and the other day uh-huh. i was actually looking at i know you trained with some of the gracies the ricks and gracies breathing technique which was very fascinating do you use like a similar breathing technique as, as oh Rickson? you mean you mean that thing where he's rolling his... yeah no like like no hicks and gracie um those guys they're on a level that that i'm not even I don't, I wouldn't even, yeah, they are on a completely different level. That, that degree of, of control of the diaphragm and his abdominals. I mean, I, on a scale of 10, I might be 0.5 literally. I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. It's yeah. My, my methods are quite simple. They're, you know, they're accessible to everybody. Right. But yeah, I would aspire to have that level. 
um, you know, I, I still try to vacuum and, and do some of the things, the basic techniques, but oh, no, he's on a completely, like he is like a Jedi. Yeah. I mean, I, he, it's, it's crazy because I think a lot of people overlook breathing, but he says, you know, before his fights, he uses these breathing techniques. So he doesn't get tired before the fight, because I think before a fight, most people would be, you know, you're in that fight or flight mode and you're very all the adrenaline's mm-hmm. coming up and then when you fight for you know a few minutes you run out of stamina but he uses these breathing techniques to really make sure that he's calming himself down which right. is really amazing you know the closest thing i can get to that is like when i was rolling um i think last time i rolled i was in my i was 50 um so it's been a while but uh, before i went I, that hurt my neck so i had to take a little time off but um what I was kind of really, I'd go to class and I'd use it not disrespectfully, but as a lab. And before it was just to kind of test, uh, and I wasn't doing at that time, I wasn't doing what you see me doing on TikTok Mm. and Instagram. A lot of that was developed just from being in staying at home and, and, you know, just having a lot of time to figure things out. But breathing was kind of what my thing was, if I can roll with a guy and only breathe through my nose at no point mm. even if it gets rough none of this i know no mouth breathing you know sometimes i'd get arm triangled and that would in the past would send me in a panic i mean i would freak if i because i would instantly get and mm. but and so there were times then towards the end where i could get or literally a guy would just neon belly and then next thing they're smothering me like just their bodies <laughs> on my face and I've got like my arm up in my ear and, and I would just practice breathing. Like they would get me eventually, right. but my thing was, it was like a rodeo ride. If I could get eight seconds of not panic and just breathing before they got me there, not literally eight, but something around that, then it, it was a good role for me. Do you, do um, you practice taking ice baths or cold showers? Cause I know when I take, cold showers the, mo- the moment the cold water hits my oh, face I, like, that, my yeah? throat closes up and i'm like trying to like, mm-hmm. oh gasp yeah for air. see in vancouver you can actually take a cold shower um i don't even bother with cold showers in hawaii because they're frustrating mm. because it's what you would you would definitely call this a lukewarm shower i see literally you would because there's no cold water <laughs> where i live I mean, um, during the winter time, it might come out a little colder. But I recently, in January, I spent a week up in Big Bear. Mm. And that water was cold. That water would was physically painful to me. And it would mess up my breathing and cross my eyes mm. and all kinds of things. And, yeah, I literally sometimes was wondering if I am going to have a heart attack. I mean, that water was wicked cold. But towards the end of my stay there, I was able to tolerate much more of it mm-hmm. in just a week. And I missed that. I still miss that. I wish I wish I could have like pay yeah. to have water like that come out of my cold water spigot. Um, because I loved waking up to that in the morning. I just oh, go yeah. in that shower, you know, okay, here we <laughs> go. And I just hit myself with that. And coming from Hawaii, that water was it literally felt like melted ice. And I'm sure you can get colder in other places, but that was, so yeah, I'm all for the cold showers, but I just don't have that available here, you know, in in Hawaii. It's just not cold enough. (laughs) I mean, it it wakes you up, right? And I've heard it decreases, you know, the body's inflammation and it helps you decrease your heart rate and it helps you, you know. Oh, it feels so good. It feels good, yeah. Yeah, man, I just, I'd wake up, I'd, I'd be in a good mood, literally. And, you know, that my coffee would taste really great. And, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be in a super happy mood for my daughters when they'd wake up. And, y- yeah, that that kind of cold water, that was really, I, I like that. So awesome. So I'm all for it, but I just can't really practice it here. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you, you do a lot of the, I've seen, I think I've seen the videos of you having this headgear tied up around the head and you're doing deadlifts. What is the benefit of training the neck? Because I don't see a lot of people training their necks. Okay, you know, I okay, mm, 
I'm not training to get a thick neck. Mm. I think, you know, just as my genetics might allow me to be a little more defined and hold more muscle at my age than is normal, I also have the lack of genetics to develop a thick neck. And I don't, I, it doesn't, I, when I was younger, I wanted to have a real thick neck. Um, but neck training for me is, the closest thing to muscle meditation as I can get, I don't know why, like even the other night I'll put a sandbag on the ground and I'll lay on my back on that sandbag and I'll just do little like either neck curls right. or protraction and retraction. Just looking up at the, the stars in the sky. I like to do everything outside and I do that. <clears throat> Like a lot of people, especially when I was younger, I used to always have neck issues or, you know, you wake up in the morning, you can't really turn, you got to turn your whole body. And when I was much younger, I had a good amount of that. And um, what I tell my clients is that if you were to remove the muscles that are attached to the base of your skull in your neck, if you were just to remove them, if they just disappeared, your arms would drop down to where your pockets are mm. because the only thing that really keeps your arms up here are the musculature and uh, structures that anchor or are anchored on your skull and your neck. Um, and I was training a lot of arms, curls and overhead presses and bench presses and push-ups and punching all day. And it wasn't until I moved back to Honolulu and I started studying, you know, medical massage and just massage therapy techniques in general that that the instructors informed that they informed me that the only thing that was holding my arms up there, my arms were my scapulae were basically suspended from my neck and the base of my skull. That's why you'll have somebody that can swing a tennis racket and next thing, boom, their neck mm -hmm. is just messed up. I mean, the action occurred out here, but then for some reason now they can't turn their head properly for a, a week and a half. And um, there's a guy, I guess, did I start this here? Or maybe, I can't remember what, but there's a guy out there named Matt Fury. Mm -hmm. And he sold a book called Combat Conditioning. And he was all about neck training and, and, right. and um, bridging and all that stuff. And then I used to watch Mike Tyson mm -hmm. um, back when he, you know, when he was coming up in the eighties and how those neck, I heard now that his neck is a little messed up. He said so on one of his, but um, I started doing that. And, but the way I, when I say it was kind of like a meditation, when I would train my, I could be frustrated because when I was a younger guy, I was prone to getting pissed off a lot. And I just had a different view of the world, which caused me to get frustrated a lot. And every time I would train my neck, it was like I took a drug. I don't know how else to, to describe it, but you know, I'll sometimes get some heat from people about my videos where I'm, where I'm taking what I regard as light weights and doing what's called a head lift, sort of like a deadlift, but you know, you're using a neck harness to lift a kettlebell off the floor. I got a ton of heat for um, a video where I hang the harness off my, and I put it backwards. So the bell is actually so going pulling up. my neck yep. and I'm doing a pull up with that. That was a very, apparently a very controversial lift. Right. And that's something that I am very comfortable with and, you know, people say there's all these things you're going to, you shouldn't post stuff like that. People are going to hurt themselves trying to do that and this and that. And that is not my intention for people to try. I clearly wrote, do not try this. And I know the reverse psychology is, oh, you tell me <laughs> not to, I'm going to. But I can't be everybody's keeper. I, I, because my thing is I am honest in what I post and that what I post is what I did that day. I don't bank exercise videos and then just post them on Monday and then choose whatever I happen to have. I'm like a fisherman. I will catch a fish and I'm going to serve it fresh. 
I don't put it in the fridge or the freezer. So whatever I post was done minutes before I actually post it. That's why I don't care about my posting times and what times my video can go viral. I could care less. If I do a workout at 1030 at night and it takes me to 1040 to put it together, then that's when I'm going to post it. I've posted at 330 in the morning and this and that. So, but going back to the next stuff, yeah, when I hang, when things are pushing my head back or I'm curling or I'm doing a pull up and this thing is trying to, you know, it's pulling my neck back and I'm also doing a pull up. That for me, um, people say that's dangerous and you can get hurt and all of this stuff and they might be correct. You can get hurt doing anything. But my comparison, the, my base for doing that is if they saw what my neck gets subjected to by jujitsu guys who weigh much more than the kettlebell they're gonna be and scared. they're pulling my head in angles that are not, and I am not in control of the speed yeah. or the velocity of that force application. Yeah. That to me is dangerous and the training I'm doing is protecting me from that. So it's just a matter of perspective, I think. But um, going back to your initial question, I would say that for the, when I need to calm down, or before I meditate some nights, I do neck curls, yep. and I'll bridge up on my neck. I use a sandbag to do both, and that just puts me in a very interesting headspace to actually meditate. I, see. I, I don't know how else to explain that, but yeah, it's um, neck training. Also, when my shoulders are feeling tight or messed up, um, they feel better after I train my neck. I, I like that you um, um, have a lot of transparency to what you post and you post exactly what you do because a lot of influencers, I think a lot of fitness influencers, they'll come up with something that they don't actually do, but they'll post it as an interesting new thing just to kind of get it. I've interested. seen some of those videos. Yeah, they're, they're like very odd objects being lifted in yeah. um, very questionable ways. <laughs> and I understand what they're doing, but um, that my you know like i'm very grateful for the attention that people have given my my tiktok and my instagram platforms and my even my i started on youtube right but it was never my intention i didn't even know it sounds kind of crazy but i didn't even that word influencer i didn't really know it until quite a way sometime after 2020 right I was I, I just started posting videos, um, I think in March. So by April of we went on lockdown in March. So by April, I'd been training clients on Zoom, and <clears throat> a lot of them were training with me on Zoom. But then on the other days, they're just drinking beer and smoking weed and partying and having fun. And I finally asked one guy, "Hey man, what does it take for me?" What what can I do to help you to train on the days where we're not on Zoom? And the guy said, hey, you know what helped me, man? Are you working out? And I I, I kind of wasn't. I wasn't really doing any real struck. He says, why don't you videotape yourself, you know, uh, mm -hmm. training, and throw that up on YouTube and just send me the link. Mm. And then I, I promise you, I will play that video. And I'm not going to do what you're going to do because I'm not you, but I'll do – because I was just asking them for 10 minutes. Yeah. He says, you throw down for 10 minutes and then um, you send that to me. And so I did. And I did that for a few days. And it was weird. Within a, about a week, one of those videos, for some reason, just it Blew went kind of like mini viral. It mm -hmm. got like 36,000 views in a few hours. And I started getting these comments from around the world. And and I had I was just shocked. I was like, wow, what is this and then but i just kept going a few days later another video just went off mm -hmm. and at that point and this people were saying hey man this is cool can you keep doing this and so i realized oh okay well at least if my clients aren't doing it there's somebody in brazil that's into it and um and that's kind of how this thing just took off i from that from april of april 13th of 2020 i i just posted every single day something yeah and it hasn't stopped and, and it, i bet it's been helping a lot of people for sure i hope so yeah i, I hope so yeah um you know i can see how uh, people would say 
oh look at this guy just going up and flexing and doing <laughs> all this stuff and and but I my intention is that I hope that they can see that I'm not just flexing I'm 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 working out I'm doing my my actual workout I'm not on TikTok but on YouTube I used to do that yeah I hope they can see that I was putting effort into what I was doing and and I was failing at times and and yeah because. Yeah, no, I, you know, going back to the, the, the head lift thing, I think mm -hmm. what's, it's pretty crazy because as Bruce Lee said, you want to train every part of your body to be strong. And I think a lot of people overlook training certain muscles. Um, and I think training the neck is probably pretty important, especially you'll see most of the people these days, <coughs> you're walking around the street and their head is usually like this. Right. right. It used to be me. <laughs> Still is sometimes if I get tired or I... Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, at that point, you want to really get that neck train to be able to pull those, you know, tuck the chin back. And because the connect, I think people forget that your whole body is connected and to really have true strength and true power, you want to make sure your kinetic chain is strong. Like, especially when you're doing a deadlift, you can't, you can't do a deadlift like... Like with a slouch neck, you can't do a deadlift with an arch. Well, I mean, for certain purposes, you can. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to make sure that connect chain is strong, everything's straight, the tr structure is there. But I just thought about when I was talking about the deadlift is that you do a type of deadlift where you're, you know, you start kind of rounding the back a little bit. You round the mid back and then the low back. Mm -hmm. I've done that one before. It feels really good. It's a really nice stretch for the back. But what would you say is kind of the main benefit? of that type of deadlift. James, could you hold on to that question for just a second? Of because course. just want to roll back to the, the neck training. There's something else that I discovered after, um, because before I was, yeah, before when I was younger, I wanted the Mike Tyson looking yeah. neck. And then, um, then, you know, I started kind of just realizing that, wow, it helped. I didn't need, my neck wouldn't go out. So it stabilized my neck and also my shoulders functioned better. But as an aside, in Hawaii, you know, a lot of people surf. Um, and then in other parts of the country, and I used to have terrible sinus allergies. Mm. And there's also also people that suffer from TMJ or um, other or tinnitus ringing in yeah. the ears and things like that. Anecdotally, I have no science to back this up. But from my personal experience, yeah. I've had variations of all of those things. I see. If I ever get water stuck in my ears and I train my neck, like I know guys that get water stuck in their ears so long they get infections or they have to literally go to a, phys or a, a medical professional to get that taken care of. Um, I've learned that when I train my ear, when I, sorry, when I train my neck, that water comes um, up. my sinuses clear, right. water or, or pressure from the airplane pops. Interesting. It is a lot of what I believe, a lot of the dysfunctions that go on within the tubes and the canals within our skull. Um, I believe a lot of those, you know, some of these tubes get torsioned or twisted of course. due to the muscular attachments causing, I don't know all that anatomy, but I do know that when I train my neck and I unload tension from my neck and my mandibles, because I don't just train my neck, when I curl my neck, Everyone I also flexing. set my jaw in a way where mm -hmm. I, I can get a like the temporalis muscle and the masseters can actually burn as I'm curling, especially with my neck. So it's not just, you know, my my anterior neck musculature. It's literally my facial muscles I'm trying to curl with as well. And when I do that, it changes my sinuses. Interesting. It changes. It's, yeah. So it's people that would want to know, well, I don't care about a thick neck and I don't do jujitsu. So I don't really care about neck training, but if you have sinus issues, especially allergies and congestion or, you know, just too much wax in your ears or water stuck in your ear, or you got off the plane and the, or you have pressure locked up in one ear, you know, just training the, the, the neck yeah. almost for me, almost every time I mean, it fixes that. I, I have a little bit of a ringing in my ears, especially when it's quiet mm -hmm. And I find okay. that when I flex my neck or flex my jaw, the ringing mm -hmm. becomes even louder. And so okay. I, I, I never made that connection where you're, you're, you know, everything's really just connected 
into yeah your, your, no your I, I'm, I'm i'm i don't like i said i don't have any scientific basis to back it up but i just know from experience that um it fixes a lot of things yeah yeah even like you know clenching jaws and a I also sometimes think that this jaw clenching that gets blamed on whatever people do at night is backed up tension in the neck mm-hmm. because I used to always have to, you know, I was always clenching my jaw. And then when I'm, now I, I routinely I train my neck and I'm always unloading and expressing the, the potential energy that gathers in the neck. And as I found if I do that, I don't seem to have this agitated jaw thing going on yeah. so but i mean inter- i hope that relative to training the neck should you also stretch your neck yes in fact the positions that i i go it into they go to they're, they're for full stretch yeah they i go to the long range of what i can achieve safely and yeah like when i when i do a neck extension with a harness on I will sometimes stand upright and let it drag my head into almost what feels like a horseshoe. And I, that once again, I, I, I'm not recommending that to anybody else, but I've been doing that for decades Mm -hmm. and I don't use, you know, I use sensible weights, but they might not look sensible to somebody just watching that. That's why whenever I post those, I have to prepare for people to kind of go off on me. Because people, for a lot of people, through their experience or just through others, were taught that the neck is almost off limits to train. And to mm. me, it's just simply the the top of the spinal column. Yeah, you know, people obsess over training their low back and the T spine and all that. But once we get above C seven, then that's off limit. Oh, you can't do. <laughs> oh, you can't do that. Everything is just no, 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 and. I just, the, to me, the neck is very resilient. It's very strong and it's capable of much more than people give it credit for. Of course. So but anyway, going back to you, I believe you are making a reference to the, what, what um, I guess they commonly refer to as a Jefferson curls. Right. These things were, yeah. Um, another theme, and once again, I, I can't recommend this to people but since i was a kid i've always been a little bit defiant um respectfully defiant of whenever i was told physically i couldn't do something i had to kind of prove that wrong and within reason like you know if you tell me hey you can't absorb the impact of jumping off a 15 foot roof I believe that mm. but if they whenever they tell me you know you can't round your back or you can't twist in a deadlift. I don't know if you've seen me also, besides these Jefferson curls you do, I will do what I call a side-to-side deadlift. I've seen where I'll that, put, yeah. Yeah, like all the way off here, and I'll lift it from that, and then I put it here yeah. and put it down, and then I bring it back. That is a no-no. And I, By the way, I don't recommend people do that unless they – You know, I coach it to some of my clients, but there's a specific method to doing that. Of course. It's not just, yeah. But I've, I, I also posted the other day, uh, one arm, um, a single arm, uh, RDL or Jefferson curl. So now we have the added torque. Anti-rotational, right. So yeah, instead of just being, yeah, we now have torque going into that movement as well. And I'm standing on a high sandbag. So I'm doing it from a deficit. So the weight, I'm trying to start those weights from well below the bottoms of my feet Mm -hmm. in some cases. Um, And that once again, as harsh as that might look, the conditions when I'm in jujitsu and there's a guy pulling me down or there's a guy on my back. And he weighs much more than the, and he's active and he's skilled and he's literally on my back trying to drag me or they've got my gi or something and they're pulling me. And, you know, the forces that I would be subjected to that I'm under control in my, in the safety of my yard, don't even compare to those, to those conditions. And I think 
a lot of the people that might criticize these movements they see if they were to experience jujitsu or oh, something yeah. similar or another thing that people do here in Hawaii is big wave surfing and getting pounded in a big wave. You want to get talk about getting twisted and bent in multiple directions all at the same time. And you're basically, you're locked into a body of water and basically being forced into whatever positions that water is, is going into that, that even that's even worse than jujitsu. Yeah. And, um, so the body, I don't think we oftentimes have the luxury of saying what we can or what we can't do based on what somebody said was bad form because life is going to put you there anyway. Yeah. So to me, it's always seemed a little absurd to say you can't do this. Or you can't do that. Of course. Like you can't lift with a round back. Look at these strong men lifting yeah. Atlas stones that are horrendous mm -hmm. in weight and the center of gravity is way out in front of them and yeah. you i don't how much more rounded can you get than conforming your body to a stone yeah right and then and and those guys keep showing up year after year every new year's i see them all doing the same thing so but yeah, i that's think like, there's it's like not to say that you should any beginner should go into it right away and do it like that i think Right. You know, some of these strong men and professionals, they train starting from a really light weight and then their spine gets used to it, learns to adapt and gets stronger in that way. And I've also recently mm -hmm. learned that there's no such thing as a perfect posture. So even if I had a, like a really tall posture, shoulders back, chins tucked, and I'm walking around like this all day, I sleep like this. You know, I've recently learned that just because you have a very nice posture and you're stuck in that posture all day, it could not it could be harmful to your body if you're not moving around you're not allowing your your joints your mobility to um because your body's made to move and yeah. so and to 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 do certain movements to do like spinal flexion movements to do round the shoulders pull the shoulders back this is what keeps the body healthy so not just being i think a lot of people have this mindset that i need to have good posture i need to be stuck in this good posture forever but to really be healthy you want to be able to move in in multiplayer planar motions and let those joints really get going right yeah yeah no it the posture and form and those are all good those are great but what I think is greater is being able to lose that posture and lose that form and not hurt yourself. Of course, yeah. That to me is a higher order of conditioning and 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 knowledge. Yeah, because it can be a little myopic and at the very least simplistic to just adhere to the tenets of what I guess somebody or some organization might define as good posture. But like I said, you don't oftentimes have the options. Life will come at you as it will, as will your opponents on the mat or the ice on the road or on the, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the milk on the floor that you're going to slip on, the mud. Yeah. And we don't always have the luxury of dictating how, you know, our, how our posture should be. Because life is going to break that all the time, and to me, you're a you're a better trained, harder to kill organism if you train outside of those parameters, and you're resilient there, and then you can go back to your posture and do that all day long. But you have added it back of up layers of insurance should things go wrong. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, now, you'll be okay. What do you say to people that? When you're doing your uh, a lot of these combined movements where you're doing your deadlift and then you're going into kind of a shoulder press and then you mm -hmm. probably i don't know if you've gotten these comments but i assume you might have is that if i'm doing these combined movements my deadlift is 10 times stronger than my shoulder press is my deadlift getting enough activation and what would you say to be no you know yeah okay so you know a good example of that would be um what I call a javelin clean and overhead or javelin clean and press where I will start with a barbell in one hand 
And I'm basically, it looks like I'm doing a one arm deadlift just with a bell in front of me. But I will accelerate that bar, bring it over the top of my head, and I'll pivot yeah. and decelerate into a lunge with that weight. Then I have to forcefully come up out of that lunge and use the momentum from the lunge to press the weight over the head. That would be separate. That would be more of a, a skill that's based on a deadlift, but the objective is very different from a deadlift. If people want to... If they just want horsepower, there's nothing better to me than a good deadlift or a good squat <clears throat> all day long. Just flat-footed, just squat and deadlift with a symmetrically loaded bar. Um, but after you've got that ho horsepower, because to me when I was doing just all only that kind of lifting, you know, I was big and I looked kind of like a big intimidating guy, but very limited athletically and I felt very just lumbery and I felt very I didn't feel agile so that when people ask me what is the purpose of is that just some fancy shit you're doing to get views and I say it could be if that's the way you look at it but to me number one I came up with that for myself I don't know if other people have done that but um, that was during the pandemic when the heaviest dumbbell I have at my home is a 90 pound power block. And I was examining options of getting more than 90 pounds. Or I should say uh, the heaviest weight I have is a 90 pound. And I was able to overhead press that or push press or whatever. That was getting to be manageable. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was examining options for getting more weight than that onto the one shoulder and pushing it overhead. And that method was kind of what I came up with. I know I've seen people just kind of pull weights up, but it looked kind of, it didn't look right to me to do it that way. And then I started looking at, well, wait a second. I mean, because I can't take a barbell and hammer curl it to my shoulder. And that wouldn't be a practical thing to do. It'd have too much rotation you know just keep going so um but then as i started to work with that movement sorry um do you, my I, I i better plug my phone and i just got a little yeah, low course. battery warning yeah, um when i started playing with um that movement hold on Good. Uh, it felt to me like, you know, there's times where in jujitsu you'll end up with where I'm on my knees and my opponent would be getting to his feet and I'm trying to stand up while he's, but he's slightly ahead of me. And then he would do something to me where I'd have to turn out and get out from him. And that's what that movement kind of felt like. Oh, I would have I to overcome a resistance and then get up high and then drop low into a lunge and then punch out of that lunge quickly and express some kind mm -hmm. of an upper body force. So it was, it was combative to me. It felt very much like it simulated a grappling situation of having, because I have to start that bell slow. I can't just blast off with it. Otherwise, I'm going to leave my lower back behind. I have to keep everything linked. And then as I'm in order for that bell to go over my head, because even if it's a 60 or a 70 pound uh, up to 80 pound barbell, if I don't do that right, there is a risk of actually, you know, yeah. flipping your, your head with that thing. And more than that, it has to look that force applied to the bar. It can't look like it was a desperate or I barely made it. It has to look clean. So um, the body control that that movement and going from frontal plane into what would now feel to me like a sagittal plane movement as I drop into the lunge, that changing of planes with this weight was also to me very significant because not a lot of move weightlifting movements out there do you actually literally change the plane or the direction that you're facing 
that to me was not common and that for my purposes that was something good to practice so i think um i think um, yeah that anybody should get into functional training to a certain extent i think adding maybe a few movements in a workout or you know like at least once a week something like that just to get the body to move the way it should move because i don't think people who train traditionally i mean i don't want to say in, in general but i think a lot of people who train traditionally aren't the most flexible or mobile or the most healthy in terms of you know joints tendons ligaments things like that i think it's just important to just have a little bit of functionality inside of the training oh yeah um because a lot of the reason why i don't do a lot of um bilateral movements is the overuse what what i felt at least for myself I would always feel like when I deadlift or squat or anything heavy overhead press with two weights versus or a barbell versus a single is that I was putting a lot of weight on bearing surfaces that were right here, mm -hmm. right down the center of me, a lot of compression into a small bearing surface. Whereas if I take a weight now and I push it one side, and I'm now opening, I'm using, I, I'm, I'm, my thing is when I lift weights, I want to spread that resistance load through as through much structure as I can. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not into isolating anything, everything. And I'm more into deceleration than I am acceleration. Of That's course. why a lot of my lifts are slow. Mm hmm Because slow, if I go slow, that means I'm controlling the balance of the weight. I'm not into weight lifting, I'm into weight balancing. Because the more proficient I am at balancing a weight, not only can I actually lift that weight, but I'm safer lifting that weight. Yes. I can't really do, like if you were to ask me to do a ring push-up, I've done ring push-up videos that get a lot of views. And people leave very flattering comments to me. What they don't realize is, I am terrible at the ring push-up. And in most cases, like if you were asked me to do just um, a regular ring push-up with my arms internally rotated, you would see a very horrible ring push-up. Mm. Um, what I try to exhibit on my videos is a rings turned out ring push-up, which is very difficult for me. And I have to go slowly and use breathing on that to maintain my balance, to stack myself into my joints so I can get as deep into that thing as I can and still get out. Of course. So the reason why I go so slow is because I have to. I'm older now and I'm just not good at that. And in order for me to balance myself and maintain balance, those adjustments I have to make slowly. I think slow is so, good. And slow allows you to create way more mind muscle connection to really focus on the muscle you should be. And that's activating. what I'm also into more. It's more like a journey. I go inside and yeah. it becomes not a push up. It's just, I don't know, an expression and a synchronization of everything I've got. Of course. That ring push up is a full body effort. It goes all the way. I'm pushing with my calves to get out of that thing. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. What people would look at as a push up. Um, and there's a lot of comments like only one. And I'm only, yeah, my, my answer is only one. That's all I got on that because it, it literally, it takes a lot of energy for me to get in and out of those, those repetitions. Yeah. And for me, I found one is plenty. So, yeah. So we, we've just gone over, you know, one hour. I, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, but I do want to go over one last question, taking it back to, breathing because breathing again i yeah, think sure. is one of the most overlooked things in training and i think breathing allows for more oxygen to circulate through the body allowing for more endurance and more power so what i know breathing is a very complex topic and you could probably spend a long time explaining it but what would be like a few cues or a few ways we could go about breathing during our workouts you know here's um there are so many 
breathing methods out there, just like there are so many ways that you can throw. There are so many types of kicks and punches and jujitsu chokes and submissions, right? There's so many of them. Um, but this is how I like my clients and anyone who cares about my opinion. That This is what I, I try to leave with them on breathing. Um, I, like almost everybody else, was taught that breathing is a tool or a, um, something you use to improve or enhance a physical expression of some sort. There are breathing techniques to improve running, breathing techniques for the deadlift, breathing techniques for breaking boards and striking. Mm -hmm. um, but for training with, let's just call it strength training, what I try to teach my clients is, number one, when I start with a new client, the first muscle group that I identify as the most important muscle group to develop by far and away is the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles between the ribs and the muscles of the trachea. All of the muscles that account for breathing. Um, that muscle group is more important than the posterior chain or any of these other fancy name things on the body. To me, those muscles need to be developed first. Yet, the last thing anybody that comes to a trainer for strength training wants to do is sit on a cushion or a chair and start doing what feels <laughs> like pranayama or yoga or some breathing tai chi. They, can, they come for strength training. So the double compression breathing that I teach my clients and I'm trying to share with people online is a method of using... I, I use basic primary lifts like the biceps curl, the push-up, the bench press, the squat. I use those exercises to strengthen people's breathing rather than using breathing to strengthen those exercises. And if it's done properly, what people... Say you got a guy that can curl 50-pound dumbbells. When I first teach him this breathing method, he always seems a little disappointed because using the breathing method, he can barely curl 30s properly. But wow. the point of it is because it's hard to take that second breath or awkward to take that second breath. Like I'll start the bells from the top. You take a big breath in through the nose. You brace or you pressurize your core and your body. And then once you initiate lowering or deceleration of that weight downwards, you're going to let out some of that breath. But not just, it has to be a, it's a very slow, measured, yeah. So that first breath, as you continue to lower, then you take a second breath through the nose, that pressure that you brace in the midsection. So it's... And then there's a period of time where you're bracing and holding that breath and you're, and you're still lowering and just gathering tension. And then at the very bottom, you blow all of that out. And a lot of people say that that screws up their strength because punctu putting those punctuations in their breathing seems to throw off the, or they, they lose tension. And I say, good then go to 20 pounds, go to the weight that is light enough where you can sequence this breathing method properly. Build yourself up from there. By the time you get up to 50 pounds with this breathing method, which happens pretty quickly, you're now going to have a diaphragm, intercostals, trachea, and other muscles that will support that lift beyond 50 pounds. Mm. So you use the exercise to strengthen the breathing then the breathing, mm. as it starts getting up to snuff, will then, on the back end, strength. It'll, it's like a give and take. It's like I, I say, you have two people. One's a big person. One's a small person. They're both weak and they're both out of shape. Normally what we try to do is we try to train. The big person represents the large skeletal muscles. 
the pecs, the lats, the quads, even the abs, the biceps, okay? So when we, when we first start training people, if we don't address their breathing at all, we just say, here, take this and do this. And they give all these really nice form cues on how to curl or press or whatever, but they don't tell the person how to breathe. That's like having, taking a big, weak person and a little, weak person and having the big, weak person piggyback on the little, weak person. And what was the first thing that happens to new clients or people that are new to fitness or re-entering fitness? They get out of breath and then they start getting dizzy and then they get nauseous and they feel like, ugh. And that, then they come back and the same thing happens. We put the big weak guy on the little weak guy and we make the little weak guy try and carry the big weak guy and we get out of breath, we get dizzy and we get queasy. My thing is the big guy, which is the bicep curl, the bench press, we're going to now, pl- we're going to put the little guy on his back and make the exercise carry the breathing method because that breathing method can be applied to most exercises. Um, there's slight exceptions with a pull up and things like that. But on most conventional exercises, especially the ones that start from the top, like a bench press starts from the top usually if you unrack it from a, you know, a bench press rack and you bring it down. A curl, it starts from the bottom, but anyone can start it up here, implement the breathing from the top down. So I use the exercises to strengthen the breathing. And it's my, it, it, was a, it took a little while because I used to literally sit people down and try to have them breathe. And nobody wants to do that. So they come in, they're, they kind of got they mentally prepared for some kind of a butt kicking you know, because they say, oh, I'm going to trainer now. This guy's going to kick my ass and have a seat here. <laughs> sit on this cushion, fold your legs and let's breathe. No, they don't want that. So I could start taking basic exercise, usually the curl or a bench press or a squat. And I'll teach them that breathing in a way, kind of tricking them into strength, learning how to strengthen their breathing. And then... Another thing that happens is we don't have to worry about teaching them form cues anymore because to match the movement to that breathing sequence, every repetition now matches the one that came before it. You have uniformity in the movement and they're also oxygenating themselves at a time where normally the muscles that are working are consuming oxygen. So at the end of the set, they don't feel dizzy and nauseous and out of breath. They actually mm. feel a little buzzy in the head, and they feel kind of like a little stone. They feel <laughs> good. So that's the premise behind the breathing. Is And how if other people want to use other breathing methods, that's fine. But I just try to piggyback a breathing method onto the bigger movement rather than trying to have them do a movement, not teaching them any breathing which is like taking an out of shape breathing apparatus or a small little person and putting their, a big guy on their back and having them walk with that guy. And the first thing that gives out is the breathing. The breathing always gives out before the muscle does. When so, you were talking about uh, stomach vacuums, was that more so during like a meditation? Um, you know, the stomach vacuum and also what I call the the fat belly or the Buddha belly, you know, where you actually kind of... Whoosh, Expand the belly, yeah. Yeah. Um, those exercises are more... Without sounding too airy-fairy or whatever, it's kind of... Those are to test my ability to, to let go. You know, I, I like to kind of practice those movements because I was taught my whole life to always suck my gut in to stand up straight, suck my gut and suck your gut in, you know, and actually the vacuuming to me, I've learned in, at least personally to me, it's a higher skill to really actually be able to let my belly fall out in front of me because I found the more I can let release my belly to just look rather unflattering and gross the more I can vacuum it in. If people only try to vacuum and only try to, that's only like, it's try like, it's like only doing triceps extensions, but no biceps curls, yeah. you know? So I've learned that if I can actually focus on 
muscle releasing the muscles of my midsection more, I can now reciprocally bring them in deeper. So that's actually kind of what I focus on more. But at the same time, um, I, I guess I'm always, my thing is always keeping that midsection braced for a punch and things. You know, I, I studied, you know, a lot of Pavel Satsaline. I'm a big student of his stuff. So, um, but yeah, the vacuum, I don't really like what Hickson can do. Hmm. I hope to be able to do mm. that one day. But to be honest with you, I haven't. I don't really spend a lot of time on that, and I'm, yeah. I would probably need somebody to instruct me on better methods to do that. I'm not the authority on that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we just hit the uh, an hour thirty mark. Thanks so much. That was a really insightful conversation we had. I definitely learned a lot. Um, is, are there any cool. last words or advice you kind of want to give the audience? You know, um, be honest with yourself. That's that's basically, you know, just be honest with yourself. Um, don't don't lift weight just for the sake of lifting weight or showing, you know, something. You know, I, there's times where you know I'll lift a weight that doesn't look impressive on YouTube or mm. TikTok or. And people say like, and I'll get plenty of comments, bro, that's like my warm up or man, I can do 50. You, all you got is one. And, and that is great. I, I'm, I actually hope that anything I do on any of my videos, it makes me happy knowing that there are people that can do more and better than me. And if all I do is show them just a variation of what they're doing, just to keep their, their, their training exciting or just a little more interesting so they'll go out on that day that they didn't want to like one of my favorite comments was man i wasn't go- I, I i was i wasn't going to go to the gym until i watched this video mm. and bro i want to try that i'm out the door that kind of a that co- kind of a comment just makes my day and it was used and sometimes it's using just a light weight so um my thing is be honest with yourself if light lightweight is what allows you to breathe properly and exhibit perfect form and express that movement beautifully, then be willing to to do that. And don't worry about the guy on the left and the right who got the big, bad, they got all these wheels and everything, big weights going good for them too. But my thing is um, I want to last in this game. I've learned that might not be the way for me to do it. So just be honest and and be kind to yourself. Yeah. Every day doesn't have to trump or outdo the day before. Be willing to step back. And if you're tired, do what you did three days ago, but with less weight and for fewer reps. And just breathe better than you did on that other day and you still win. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's, that's it. Yeah. Just be honest with yourself. I love it. Thanks so much, Bill. Of course. Why not, James? All right, guys. So that wraps up episode 11 of Jim Bro Talks. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Again, this episode was packed with information that I'm hoping you're able to take away and put it into your own programming. As always, thanks again for joining me for another episode. In my bio, you can apply for one-on-one coaching with myself. And again, I want to hear it from you guys. Who do you want on the show next and what questions should I ask them? Again, this is James from Jimbo Talks. I'll see you in the next episode.